my very first job, I needed to earn some money, but I was in college. And I got a job at a newspaper. And I was assigned to the editorial department. And my boss said, okay, in the morning, the news hasn't happened for tomorrow. So by midnight now, they're trying to put the pages together. But there are pages you can work on early in the day. So he handed me a book of classified, um, sorry, horoscopes and the classifieds. And make sure that the spelling is correct, because if you mess it up, the person paying for the ad is going to say, hey, or ad isn't right. So I worked on the pages that were ads and the horoscope. So I went to him after 10 minutes and said, you know, the horoscope in this book is not for tomorrow. I probably told this story several times. He said, as long as you don't publish the same thing two days in a row, it doesn't matter. 18-year-old <laughs> me being told by a grown adult who is in charge of the newspaper, the horoscopes is just entertainment. And I kind of knew or suspected that, but I hadn't had much interaction with horoscopes. But he said, as long as you don't publish the same thing two days in a row, it doesn't matter what day it is. <laughs> I hope no one is disappointed that the horoscopes are made up stuff. <laughs> Three sentences, <laughs> saying positive things, general so that it can apply to everybody in the world. <laughs> is anyone upset because they said the horoscopes are real? No, it's really the occult. So that also leads us into today's passage where the king emperor, Nebuchadnezzar, is consulting with magicians. Astrologists, sorcerers, and enchanters. That's how the passage starts out. He has this dream, and he calls his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers. I'm going to go a little outside of the biblical context and say, I suspect that Nebuchadnezzar wasn't believing in them very much. He had a suspicion that they were going to make up stuff. So he goes to them and he tells them, okay, here's what happens. And they say, oh, king, live forever. Who lives forever? But that's how they would greet it. Live forever. I guess in the old country they'd say, God save the king, or the king is dead. Long live the king, something like that. So probably was equivalent to that, but oh, king, live forever. So if you're going to live forever, it means nobody's going to knock you off. And you will not age? I don't know. But anyway, that was their greeting to the king. Oh, king, there forever. Magicians, sorcerers, astrologers, enchanters. These people were considered the wise men. And it was mainly men in those days, I would think. The wise men of the country, in their culture. And it's not only Babylon, but I guess ancient um, Middle Eastern or whatever regions of the world. That's what they did. They relied on those kinds of people, to tell them the future. But I'm guessing that if you don't believe in them, you're going to put them to a test. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar is such a, I don't want to say demon, a bad guy, that he says, I'm going to tell you, let me back up, I had this dream. And they said, well, that was a dream. He said, no, you tell me my dream. And then interpret my dream. And if you don't do it, off with your heads. Really? Over a dream? I mean, dreams? Come on, you're kidding me. You had pizza last night, you got a bad dream? Oh, get over it, my friend. So anyway, that's some of the back story. As I'm going to start with the end of this story. Daniel chapter 2. <clears throat> Again, when we get to the actual reading, we're going to read... Verses 1 through 11 and 18 through 28. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come. And the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. This is Daniel telling him what his dream was. As for me, this mystery was revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation, and that you may understand what went through your mind. Verse 31. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. 
The head of the statue was made of pure gold. Its chest and arms are of silver. Its belly and thighs are of bronze. It sounds like the Olympics, right? Its legs of iron. Its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken into pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them all away, swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. And the Buchan Desert said, Whoa, man, that's my dream. How did you? He said, God revealed this to me. Because what Daniel did is he prayed and asked God to reveal to him what the dream was. Now he's going to interpret the dream. I'll keep going. Verse 36. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. That's a good feeling for the emperor, right? Yeah, I'm the head of gold. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. In other words, you will not live forever. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. And finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things into pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. I'll stop there. Uh, that's the spoiler, how the dream will be interpreted. So we have to go back to where he's having this dream. And he is thinking, okay, how do I get this dream explained? Why are we studying this? Partly because we used the curriculum that said Daniel 2 is the passage for today. But also because we want to understand that God is the giver of wisdom. Wisdom comes from God. And Nebuchadnezzar kind of would have relied as would his fathers and his descendants as well, on these sorcerers and magicians and enchanters and astrologers, because those were the people who surrounded the king and gave counsel. But he wasn't quite having it. He put them to a test. A test they were going to fail. Except that Daniel, this Hebrew, well, if he came in two years earlier, he's still in the college. This is two years after Nebuchadnezzar became the emperor of this empire. So, and we said last week they were in training for three years. So somewhere in there, he's still quite new to this thing, but Daniel is sought after to give interpretation because every wise man was about to lose his head for not being able to interpret this dream. I said last week that I'm not exactly the biggest fan of prophecy because there's so many camps out there interpreting things and I don't know which is correct and I don't want to lay my mind to things that the Lord hasn't fully revealed to me I'll let those of you who have a little more knowledge speak about this if you want to but my preference is that we just stick to the essence of the curriculum and afterward <laughs> we can discuss more of the details as you see them so that's where I wanted to start today start with the end and now we're going to go back to the beginning the handout you have in front of you, I'm going to read the session in context, and then we'll work our way through some of the questions. King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed something that did not make sense and deeply troubled him. Like many people in the ancient world, the king believed the gods communicated with people through dreams. He knew that such dreams frequently carried foreboding messages. So Nebuchadnezzar called upon his most skilled interpreters, the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers. Some of these had studied records of past dreams. Others relied on ecstatic experiences to gain insights. Still others studied the movement of stars for clues. Normally after hearing the content of a dream, they would suggest possible interpretations. 
But Nebuchadnezzar refused to tell his wise men what was in the dream. The Babylonian wise men responded, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. Even they knew only the divine could interpret the dream. In today's session, Daniel's response to a deeply troubled king seeking wisdom in the wrong ways and from the wrong sources is a reminder of how important it is to seek a reliable source of wisdom. I chose two songs to go with the session, and now I'm changing my mind on the first song, again, in the interest of time. I'll tell you a little bit of backstory to William Cowper. He had mental challenges. He was the best friend of John Newton. Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. And he wrote for him as well. But he was in an insane asylum for some period of time because his mind just played lots of tricks on him. But he wrote a lot of beautiful songs. This one says, and we don't normally sing this, even though it's in the songbook. I don't know how many of you have sung this song. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. The reason I chose that song was because his sovereign will is mentioned there. And our songbook suggested that for this passage, that would be the appropriate song. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, in the back of the songbook, they have scripture references to each of the songs, and the scripture reference to Daniel 2 is this particular song. The song is a beautiful song. I said it's a pity we don't sing it, but I'm guessing in England they will sing it, and the tune is normally uh, London New. There are two tunes that go with this. Anyway, that's one of them. The other one puts in a chorus, which is interesting. Other denominations sing it with a chorus, but in our song, but we don't have a chorus. At the very end of the page, I have a song that I would prefer to use. So if you look at the very bottom, song number 573. Again, we don't sing this song very much either. Quick story. This song made its entry into the Salvation Army songbook, started with the 2015 songbook. It wasn't there before. But it's extremely, huh? Wow. But it's extremely popular in Britain. And Commissioner Roberts has told us that somehow the Brits get their way when it comes to <laughs> what they want. That's what the general is. <laughs> it's a beautiful song, and it's an Irish song. So it goes back hundreds of years. And if you have Irish extract, you probably are familiar. It's a very beautiful song. I'm going to read. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Be all else but naught to me, save that thou art. Be thou my best thought in the day and the night, both waking and sleeping, thy presence my light. Different denominations sing it a little differently, different words, so just in case you are thinking, where are those words coming from? Other denominations rearrange the words. I think the third line says, naught else, it starts with naught, whereas this has naught somewhere in the middle of the sentence. One more verse. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. And that's the reason I chose this song, because we're talking about wisdom. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. Be thou ever with me, and I with thee, Lord. Be thou my great father, and I thy true son. Be thou in me dwelling, and I with thee, one. Mary Byrne is the one who translated it, 1880 to 1931. All right, we're going to pray, and then we're going to work through the scripture and answer a few of the questions on the curriculum. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for every blessing you bring to us and every opportunity you give us to sit around and break spiritual bread. Be with us as we study your word today. Reveal to us as only you can what you would want us to get from this particular lesson. And may we leave this place saying we were glad we came today for Christ's sake. Amen. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. 
the king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, Let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to t tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. Pause for one second. For those of you who are using your Bible, we jump to verse 18 now. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a dream. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made, no made known to us the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to Ariok, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Ariok took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dreams mean. The king asked Daniel, also known as Belshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Thank you. Again, it's a little choppy what we've done here, what the curriculum has done. But again, hopefully that is not going to be too much of a challenge for you. So let's start now at the beginning. Question number one. I ask, how does the king react to his anxiety? and lack of understanding. In the first three verses, what is the king's reaction to his anxiety and lack of understanding? Verses he was one. trembled. Mm -hmm. Kept him awake. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Called in all his people. He called in the wise, the wise people mm -hmm. and he said, I've had a dream that troubles me. There was no pizza in those days, so there's probably a good reason why you know, I was troubled. I want to know what it means. He also believed the gods were communicating with him through the Again, I say that he probably is putting the wise people to a test because he could easily tell them as their request what the dream is and let them have their best shot at it. But he is having this dream, he's thinking. I really want to know what this means, but I don't want anyone making up stuff, <laughs> guessing. Because it's not urgent that he understands this dream. As we looked at it, nothing is going to happen in his lifetime. It's after he is gone that the empire will end and then the other empires will come about. Yes. 
So I think that what you just said is very much related to chapter 1, verse 20. And it says, in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, that being, you know, uh, Daniel and um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in, who were all in his realm. And so it made me think that if we've just brought some people in from somewhere else, and you've been here all this time, how is it that they are ten times better than you? And so right after we find out they're ten times better than you, now let's put you to the test because why would they know more and be able to do better and you've grown up in this thing? So I think that may be part of what instigated the test. He may have left that session of testing with the Hebrews with some kind of consternation about his own magicians and astrologers and whatnot. Any other comment? I think, I think he was narcissistic and he really loved himself. He wanted people to praise him. So when they come, oh, king, live forever. He eats that kind of stuff up. But at some point, you can get a little leery of people who are complimenting and praising you. Huh. You put them to a test. Have you ever had anyone butter you up with compliments and you figure, I'm real suspicious of where you're going here. I'm not saying that was the case, but at some point, he is king of kings. And if these people get this kind of counsel, and it's like, okay, guesswork, you can tell me about stuff that's going to happen after I die. And I can't prove that you were right. So he's having this dream, and he's trying to figure it out. But the scripture does say he was deeply troubled. It's an interesting set of circumstances there. Any other comment? Otherwise, we move to question number two. How does the confidence of these magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers change after they hear the king's demands? O king, live forever. How does it change after he tells them, I'm not going to tell you the dream? What do you see? In verses 5 through 6. They ask him to tell them, because they obviously can't. No, With more firmness, what do they say? There's not a man on earth who can do what the king asks. Oh, yes. Are you kidding me? Nobody can do this. Why are you asking us to do the impossible? We're only magicians and astrologers. We don't do the impossible. Okay. He knew that, John. Mm-hmm. But I think because he loved himself so much and he was accustomed to this kind of worship from these people and you tell them stuff, that, okay, let's see what they have to say. He looking for, he didn't want to know that this could be true. That maybe his dream wasn't what he thought it was. If I tell you a story about your great grandchildren after you're gone, do you really want to know all of what they're going to do? Or you say, hey, I'll be gone, I'll be looking down from heaven. But in other words, he will not be around. Right. And it goes hundreds of years, thousands of years into the future. Right. This dream does. So, okay, I had this interesting dream. God revealed to me in this dream something that would happen in history. Well, in the future. Does he know that? Yes, I saw a hand over here. I don't know. No, I, I don't think the king knew that, right? That's why he wanted to interpret it. Yeah, yeah, he didn't understand the dream. Right? But right. after all this gobbledygook that they'd been telling him all along, he knew it was a bunch of baloney. Oh. As, as it were, as it I, mean, I, would, I would think he did you know he, he felt good about it how afraid he is and everything yeah. but the God, God was speaking to him and saying there's something he felt he felt that somebody was talking to him about something important and he didn't realize that before it was just all the blowing going on I think it's interesting that Nebuchadnezzar is chosen to receive this information that we now look and say, yeah, we know that there's these four empires in our history, but in his future. I was going to say, I don't want us to divorce the fact that the occult is real and that these people may have been in touch with some dark forces and had some marginal success in whatever they were saying. I have a note on the verse that I read earlier that says the occult forces were no match for the Spirit of God. 
modern cultic movements are merging many of these spiritual counterfeits into a contemporary revival of occultism. <laughs> and so we see that all today. We can go on 15 Mile and see the psychic who will tell you whatever and take your money. And if she or he, I don't know who it is, says anything that even almost sounds like it was real to your life, my assumption would be that you're in contact with some dark entity. And so I want us to not forget that that thing is there, it is real, it may have been informing these magicians, but at the end of the day, they are no match for the Spirit of God, the Word of Knowledge, the Word of Wisdom. And so when Daniel, uh, not Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar puts them to the true test, this is no different in my mind than when the snakes, or the staff turns into snakes, and then the, the staff from Moses eats the other ones. They demonstrated they could do something similar, but the word of the Lord and the power of God overrides everything. I was just reflecting while she was speaking. Back in the 90s on television, there was a season where lots of psychics came on. Like they bought time on TV. Miss Cleo? Cleo. Dion Okay. I remember Miss Cleo and the psychic, hot, the psychic hotline. Did any of you ever call the psychic hotline? Just kidding. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, my friend used to go to one and I would say, why are you doing yeah. that? Don't do that. Yeah. All right, question number three. When Daniel hears why the king is upset, and I'm apologizing here because the curriculum broke at verse 11. And this is verse 12. So you have to go back to your Bible to see this particular fact. Daniel hears why the king is upset. He asks for more time. So let's go back to verse 12. The king is angry. He ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued, verse 13, to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. So that bothered me. Men were sent. So the king issued a decree that the wise men of Babylon be put to death, and somebody said, oh, let's include these guys from Judah as well. Wise men. just thought were ten times better, but now they're not. Right. So I don't know if the king issued that decree for these individuals to be included. I don't think so. But I think whoever received the order decided to go with the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. And they said, hey, let's find these Hebrew guys as well. If all of our wise men are going to get executed, execute the guys from Judah as well. Cast the net and say, there are some of the wise men Remember, they're only there two years now, and they're still in training, but somehow they get caught in this net. Thankfully, the commander of the king's guard, verse 14, Arioch is his name, he went to put to death the wise men of Babylon. Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. Verse 15, he asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. I'm proposing that Daniel and his friends were not part of this execution order, but somebody was implementing it as, okay, yeah, all the wise people get executed. It's a terrible thing. And Daniel intercedes and says, okay, let me go and talk to the king. And then he's going to tell the king, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Even though they have failed, do not execute them. In 12 it says, So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and they were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Mm -hmm. so, so I was saying that the decree was issued for the wise men of Babylon, but some people were impl implementing it as everybody gets included. They're in Babylon, they're not of Babylon, but you can split the letter there to say, hey, include them as well. Because Daniel then chooses to go to the king. He tells the commander who was going to execute these people, do not, what do you say? Why does the king issue such a harsh decree? Daniel went to the king and he asked for time. The king wasn't going to give them any time. But somehow Daniel goes and says, can I have some time? And the king gives Daniel time. He wasn't going to give his wise men any time, but he gives Daniel time. 
the they Lord has ordained. Hmm? They didn't ask for more time either. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they knew it, it didn't matter how much time they had, they still couldn't do it. Right. <coughs> right. Without, 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 Daniel did. But Daniel knew. Because he knew who he had to consult. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So then he goes and he finds his friends. Let's keep going. Verse 17, Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they didn't know anything about this either, or this execution order. He urged them to plead for mercy from God of heaven concerning the mystery so that he and his friends may, be, may not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Whoever was going to implement the order as everybody, they were going to get executed, even if the king had not issued the order to execute them, they were going to be included because once the executioner comes, he's going to say, hey, one blow, <laughs> he strikes everybody. I love the next verse. During the night, verse 19. Let's say 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Have you ever heard of a praise break? What? Praise break. Everybody starts praising God. <laughs> That's what they went into a praise break here. Daniel comes up with this praise song. This in this psalm, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. I want you to spend a few minutes looking at that line by line. Forever and ever. God who is eternal. Praise the eternal God. Wisdom and power are his. Wisdom. Omni. Omniscient? Omniscient. Power. Omni. Omnipotent. Omnipotent. So he's given God what God is due. God, who is eternal, all powerful, and all knowing, changing times and season, deposing kings, and raising others up. Given what wisdom to the wise, knowledge to those who are seeking knowledge, revealing deep and hidden things, knowing what lies in the darkness and in the light that dwells in him. Verse 23, I thank and praise you. That's why he says it's a praise break. He starts with praise. Praise God. I thank and praise you. You've given me wisdom and power. You've made me known. You may know to me what we ask of you. We have made you have made known to us the dream of the king. I need somebody to reflect and, re and respond there. He asked the Lord to reveal it to him. The Lord revealed it to him, and he immediately goes into thankfulness and praise. And when we pray, and God answers our prayer, sometimes we move along without remembering to. Thank God and praise God for the answer to the prayer. But sometimes the answer is not what we want. And you don't want to praise and thank God for the answer you don't want, right? Yes. I want to go back to verse 11 and then what happens to Daniel and then tie it to the Gospels. And so in verse 11 it says, It's a difficult thing that the king requests. And there is no one who can tell it to the king except... I'm not going to say except God, mm -hmm. right? They say the gods, but except God, whose dwelling is not with flesh, right? So their understanding of God mm -hmm. is that he is not with flesh, and they know they can't do it except God be with flesh. They were wrong, because they then find, as we get to verse 19 and 20, that the Lord, that Daniel prays, and the Lord reveals that he is, as we also learned in chapter 1, that the Lord is with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, or Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah. And then that takes me into the Gospels where Jesus says, and the Holy Spirit will come, and he will lead you into all truth. Now that's not exactly dream interpretation, but it reminds me, and maybe we've all had the experience, where the Lord brought a piece of information across your radar, or the Lord revealed something to you that you would have never been able to figure out on your own, or he just showed you something. Because 
what they are saying doesn't happen, what Daniel experiences is our everyday reality if we would yield and listen to the voice of the Lord who does dwell within us in the person of the Holy Spirit and around us as the Sovereign Almighty every single day of our lives. And so as you ask about the praise, it makes me think that as we seek the Lord and ask for his guidance, as we seek the Lord and ask him to help us, when he does, in that moment, we should stop and praise him. Thank you, Lord. I had no idea. Thank you for showing that to me. Thank you for revealing this to me. We need to recognize that many things in life we're not figuring out on our own. Some we are, some we're not. In some instances, the Spirit of the Lord is showing things to us, revealing things to us, and leading us, as was promised, into all truth. Mm -hmm. I apologize for my seeming distraction here. A song was running through my head, and I looked it up. It's the wrong song. The tune is da 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 And one of the lines says something about I know my weakness, for I know my weakness, and I couldn't find the right song. Uh -huh. Here then our answer is the one I looked up. Here then our answer, Lord, you just saw in fighting our rest, but that's not the one. I'll look it up and bring it back next time. Daniel knew his weakness. And he wasn't afraid to say that he needs help. Whereas these wise men didn't show any weakness, they would just say whatever came to their mind. He knew that there's no way he could get this answer without going to God. I want you to ponder that. Sometimes we go with human knowledge. And we need to figure out how to go to God. This is a mixed bag for me, and I apologize. God gives us intellect. And he doesn't micromanage our decision making. But it's still a good practice to include the Lord in every decision. So talking to the Lord constantly says, Lord, I'm in tune with the fact that you are helping me to make my decisions. Guide this decision. Even a trivial decision. It's not necessarily a bad thing. All the help you can get. Okay. People buy insurance for things that they don't need insurance for just in case. I'm not using that as an analogy, but I'm saying what's wrong with asking the Lord to always be with you in your decision making? It's a good practice. And I'm talking to people who are longer in this thing than I am. But talking to the Lord constantly is a good practice. Is there anyone who will agree with this? I'm kind of caught you in a bad place, right? You can't say no, I disagree, right? Talking to the Lord constantly is a good practice to have. And if it, you don't have that practice, I would encourage you to consider it. Even things like meditating on his word several times per day. Pausing to make sure that you're in communion with him. That closer fellowship is a good thing. I would say it's even beyond a good practice. It's a lifestyle. And it reminds me of something that Bob said maybe a few years ago about what it means to walk with the Lord. And when you're walking with the Lord, you are in communion and he walks with me and he talks to me and I'm talking to him and I'm listening to him and I just remember Bob was just talking about what it means when you're walking with the Lord and in constant communion, not just contact, but also he's holding your hand, he's leading you and so since I always look at it like this if the Lord is counting the hair on my head then there is nothing that he is not interested in knowing about me or anything that I could go to him about. You're counting the hair on my head. I don't even know how many hairs are on my head. But that's how much he is concerned with everything about me. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at question number four, number five. Why does Daniel describe God's revealing the meaning of the dream as mercy? <clears throat> Verse 18. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. Plead for mercy. Why is Daniel describing this as pleading for mercy? Saving their lives? 
Yeah. He's about to be executed. Even if the king doesn't want him executed, the executioner is coming for him. Because that's how it's being interpreted. He was going to be killed, and he's saying, and we need God to be merciful. We're running out of time. Question number seven. Does it surprise you that Daniel tells the king's executioner to spare the wise men of Babylon? Yeah. I'm looking for the verse. Verse 24. He says, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king. And I will interpret his dream for them. Why spare these jokers, right? But, but what's Daniel's beef with them, right? So, um, they, Daniel's not beholden to them. They're not beholden to Daniel. You know, they are caught up in a system that they don't understand. It reminds me of Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You know, it's like killing someone before you share the gospel with them. And so, to me, it's shows, again, his relationship and understanding that he would say, don't kill them. They're walking in darkness. Well, they can't help themselves. Let's show start this. Mercy. Right. Let's yeah, show this them path them. of light. It is like the mercy of Christ. You know, give them a chance to come into the knowledge of who God is, the real, the new, true and living God is. So if they can see by example how the light of God shines, then maybe, I mean, you don't pray for bad things to happen to other people. You shouldn't. They're saying that may I be a light to them to lead them out of darkness. So that was part of his request there. That leads me to question number eight. Why is it important for us to desire mercy to be shown to others? Important. And I think that's what happened with Daniel. I mean, he, he was able to demonstrate that he couldn't tell the king his thing without God <laughs> doing it. With, without that time to be with God and, and know that. Um, so when we show mercy to other people, it, it's a benefit for us that we're saying God is showing them that mercy. Because in my humanness, maybe I wouldn't be showing those mercy. Mercy will be shown to those who show mercy. Yes. Okay. Question number ten. How does God respond to our lack of knowledge and lack of knowledge and understanding? How does God respond to our lack of wisdom and understanding? Can we bring those things to God? If so, why do you think we're able to do so? Well, the Bible tells us to, right? Mm -hmm. And James, if anyone lacks wisdom, to ask for it, and he'll give it to us without reproach. So that says the Lord is not upset if you admit that you <laughs> lack wisdom, because he already knows you lack wisdom. That's right. And I think that also says, we, how much more, since he's saying, if anyone lacks wisdom, come and ask for it. Should we be asking for it? <laughs> it there's a certain, you know, maybe even unintentional arrogance in not asking for wisdom in many of the circumstances that we're facing. You think you with. know it all. You think you know it all. Right. You know the song, I can't find it very quickly. It says, ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, keep you. He is willing to aid you. And you know, Kathy just through. made an excellent point, Ed. Can you say it again? Oh, I just said there's a big difference between knowledge and Mm -hmm. Because you might think you know something, Wisdom. right? Applying that. Knowledge. You're applying as the law. Wisely as you can. The letter. But the wisdom might be the thing that you would not expect to do. Mm -hmm. So the, not, the, the, the letter of the law is, oh, they're a wise man, they, they're the uh, issue for their death. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead and keep telling them. Wisdom is saying, wait. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, there's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And also, you might have knowledge, but your knowledge is not very mature. It might be a surface knowledge, and you need to go back and do more fundamental things, or more research, or ask other people sometimes. That's the Holy Spirit. Right. Because right. he gives wisdom to the wise, right. so even if you have a little bit of wisdom, you can get more. Right. And to those who ask. Right, right. 
<laughs> even and, if you're not wise, learn to ask. And yeah. even beyond that, you can have wisdom and lack understanding. Right. Because it says, right. with, you know, it's this principle thing. But get understanding. Mm -hmm. And that only comes from the Lord as well. The understanding of something only comes from the Lord. Quick anecdote. Our youngest son called last night. He was having problems with one of his assignments in college. You know. Okay. And I said, I'm not going to tell you what to write. I'm going to listen to you talk it through. So you can mature in this process. He was panicking over a small assignment. He didn't read the instructions carefully. He didn't understand what was being asked. Sometimes we need to mull these things over, but certainly ask for help. And I was glad that he asked for help. It reminds me that I should also ask for help. And we should ask for help. And telling the Lord our thoughts and our... He knows, but that communion helps us to grow closer to him. And I think that that pleases him. The same way I was pleased that the kid called to say, hey, can you tell me what this assignment means? Yes. We would have to be humble mm -hmm. and not act as if we have all the answers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and recognizing our limitations, which is not easy for people. But if we recognize our limitations and we know where to go, the answers, mm -hmm. then we don't have to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. yeah, your comment brought to mind another thought. Sometimes people are okay with a half-baked answer. And we should want better than half-baked. We should want excellence. So you're saying, you know, I just don't want an answer. I want the best answer. So I will work at trying to get that best answer. Seek and counsel. Because if you figure the Lord said go in this direction, and you go in that direction, maybe the Lord is saying more. You just need to ask for more help. Lord, and what do I do when I get here? Where do I turn? So, again, back to the analogy of last time. I was glad that he asked, because it gave me a chance to participate in helping to shape that. Hopefully he wouldn't ask again about the same thing, because he learned the lesson. So the wisdom will turn, the knowledge turns into wisdom. And then hopefully we get better at this. We are at the end of the hour. I'm going to give somebody a chance to, I feel so happy that we have all this time, somebody to reflect on this passage. Again, I've tried not to get into the prophecy <coughs> much because it's outside of my realm. And again, we don't have the time, but I give someone a chance to, yes. I want to go to your question number 11. <coughs> it says, what resources does God give us to help guide us into wisdom and deeper faith. First of all, he gives us himself in the person of the Holy Spirit, who is there to guide and lead us. But then he also gives us others who study and are um, have their own knowledge and wisdom. He gives us his word. He gives us constant contact through prayer, through talking to him. I think that this is so important. We are not by ourselves and left with nothing. We have what we need to seek and understand and, and deepen our faith. We just have to take advantage of it. I know what I said we're out of time. But I just want to reiterate the song, Ask the Savior to Help You. Comfort, strength, and keep you. He is willing. He's willing. And he will carry you through. Heavenly Father, thank you for this reminder that wisdom comes from you and you do not get any bit upset when we keep calling on you for help, even when we think we know. Help us to develop that pattern where we are always seeking you, dear God. That sweet fellowship of communion with you about everything in our lives. May this lesson strengthen us and encourage us and help us to be an encouragement to others, to remind them as well because you don't know who is going to cross our path. So maybe this lesson be valuable to us in terms of imparting knowledge and wisdom and leading others to you. Bless us as we go into our holy next meeting, and may we have a good time praising you today. For Christ's sake. Amen. Thank you.